Thank you so much for coming and welcome to this discussion on how surveillance impacts today's kids, tomorrow's human rights activists. Um, we want to look at how ubiquitous surveillance has a chilling effect on kids' activities and um, also the right to protest. Uh, well, the bad, I have good news and bad news. I'll tell you the bad news first. The bad news is that um, this panel discussion is not uh, mere speculation, but very much linked to uh, reality. We know, for example, that in Germany, uh, climate activists have been put into preventive um, detention where the police in states, in German federal states, where the police is also using Trojan horses, um, which is a tool that is used, for example, to read chats and email exchanges. Uh, another example is uh, more recent from the UK because beginning of January the UK uh, counter-terrorism police placed uh, Extinction Rebellion on a list of extremist uh, ideologies that should be reported to the authorities running the uh, PREVENT program. Uh, I guess we will hear from our speakers a bit more about uh, what PREVENT is. Um, but in any case, in the guide that was issued by the police, uh, people were advice to uh, listen and look out for um, young people who neglected to attend school or uh, participate in planned school walkouts. So um, yeah, so since the climate protests have gained momentum and are being kept alive, uh, especially by like hundreds of thousands of, of young people, this means at least in my opinion, that kid surveillance uh, is becoming even more worrying. Um, so today we want to focus on not only on surveillance that happens by police in the streets during protests, but uh, also uh, on surveillance, um, well, where kids spend the most of their times, and that is to say in schools. Um, the good news now is that there's a couple of people, not many, but a couple out there that are fighting in courts and outside courts, uh, in policy debates and in activism or journalism against uh, uh, massive surveillance. Um, so I'm super happy that uh, we can tell you a couple of uh, success stories um, here today. Um, it's a rather gloomy topic, but actually we, we will have a rather positive take on it, I, I guess. Um, so uh, since I'm a tiny bit sick, I will let the speakers speak and share their expertise. Um, so uh, yeah, to my right, uh, first of all, uh, well, to begin, we have Jen, Jen Person. Uh, yes, that's, uh, yes, Jen. Uh, director of Defend uh, Digital Me, who's been advocating for children's uh, privacy and data protection rights for quite some time now. Um, she coordinates campaigns, among others, on the National Pupil Database, the UK Prevent Program, and uh, the UK National Census. Uh, next is uh, Daniel Carey, uh, who is a solicitor and partner at, oh my god, uh, Dayton Pierce Glynn, yes. Uh, he will tell us a bit about a case study uh, based on a court case from last year um, where um, a child was affected by the UK's counter-extremism program. <coughs> and uh, he will tell us how he uh, managed to uh, obtain the deletion of records and he will go into subject access rights and uh, correction deletion rights. Um, then uh, we have Gracie uh, Bradley, she's a human rights policy expert, writer and activist. Um, she leads policy uh, campaigns, work to defend civil liberties in policing, immigration, counterterrorism, and data slash tech context uh, at Liberty and she was also a founding member of the Grassroots Against Borders for Children campaign. So I think she will tell us a bit about uh, her experience and the case study regarding the UK national school records for immigration enforcement, um, which was very successful, I hear. Um, and finally, we have uh, Gloria gonzalez Fuster, um, who is a research professor at LSTS at uh, Freie Universität Brussel. 
um, she will help us uh, leave the UK and take us more to uh, European grounds. Um, and I think you will explain about the legal situation in the EU, the gaps and the issues with enforcement. <coughs> so, um, yeah, um, my name is Kirsten Fiedler. Uh, until recently, um, I've been managing director of EDRI and uh, for the four, uh, well, four months, last months, I've been working as policy advisor in the European Parliament for a Green MEP. Um, yes. So, Jen, um, you've been campaigning against the various surveillance measures um, targeting kids. Um, I think in this audience we have also uh, many non-UK people. So can you give us a brief explanation and overview of the uh, programs and tell us about your work? Thank you and uh, thank you to Edri for the invitation. My call here this afternoon is less to tell you about my work and hope to call you to action. There is too little involvement and engagement in the NGO, civil society and policy making community in privacy, data protection and rights that involves children or engages with youth issues. Children often are seen as an other, an add-on, a, a community to be protected. And it is under that protection regime that children often lose their rights. Children find that protection trumps privacy and increasingly it trumps participation online. Our work began in 2014 as a call to action from teachers and parents who were appalled at the commercial and the state surveillance through data surveillance, so data surveillance in the school census. We found that um, increasingly the government was collecting nationally more and more information about each individual named child in England from 23,000 schools. The National Pupil Database is now a 23 million strong database and is only one of the 50 data sets that our Department for Education manages, one of which this weekend, if you saw the news from England, had a breach when the Department for Education enabled a company it claimed gave the data for employment screening, had then enabled a third party to use that same data for onboarding potential customers through age verification and identity checks. And they claimed they had boosted gambling companies' uptake of their customer base by 15%. Scope creep is inevitable when you collect a mass amount of data. And we have a 20 year old now census that was collected narrowly for the purposes of education, which is now being used by commercial companies across the board and breaches even by the gambling community. This should serve as a warning and I hope a call to action to understand better what data are being collected in your education systems and find out what they're being used for. The premise of today's topic is how surveillance is shaping today's children's behaviors, tomorrow's human rights activists. We heard this morning from two human rights activists who are children. Fridays for Future. Children are also human rights activists. They're not tomorrow's human rights activists. They are today's. But they're also tomorrow's policymakers and politicians and citizens and migrants and everyone else that we hope we can uh, improve their rights and freedoms through the preservation of their data and privacy rights amongst others. So how do we look out for them today? Gracie is going to go on to tell you about um, some of the successes that the, their uh, work had in terms of uh, school records. But uh, we're also going to hear from Daniel who will talk about the case where um, a child uh, was caught up in data surveillance through the PREVENT program. And the second thing I want to talk to you about before we move on is to ask you to be aware of what is happening in your own countries and own school systems in terms of countering violent extremism. In 2016, the UN Joint Declaration found that countering violent extremism programs generally offer insufficiently clear, in, 
definitions of extremism or radicalization, and that some governments target journalists, bloggers, dissidents, activists, or human rights defenders as extremists or terrorists. This precision, this definition, is already lacking in the expansion of this program in the UK. In 2015, the Counterterrorism and Security Act placed a duty on public authorities, including schools, to have due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. And it expects that they assess the risk of children being drawn into terrorism, including support for extremist ideas that are part of terrorist ideology. This is commonly known as the prevent duty. How did schools go about enforcing this? There was one line of text in a Department for Education piece of guidance that required schools to monitor for signs of extremism and terrorism in online activity. Software companies across the UK took this chance to sell to schools, and there are around 15 companies that supply the majority of schools in England with safeguarding in school software. It is surveillance software. It monitors through what you might consider man in the middle software against keywords which are stored in libraries of up to 20,000 words, which the companies themselves define together with the Internet Watch Foundation and Counterterrorism Unit. But the children, parents, and schools do not necessarily know themselves what these words are. So the child will go onto the internet in the morning, log in with their password, and the software automatically kicks in, surveilling everything that they type, that they search for, that they upload, download, incoming and outgoing communications. And any one of these words might trigger, for example, a search by a boy of 15 who searched for black rhinos, triggered a, an alert that he might be a potential gang member. Or the girl that was searching for cliffs, who was then flagged as a potential suicide risk. And most shocking of all, one of these companies uses in their marketing materials, online and in brochures, that they identified offline use by a 17-year-old girl at a sixth form college, that she was writing a letter to her mother about rape, and the company identified this, flagged it to the school, and told them about what she was typing offline. These software are very little understood, but they are very widespread in use. The Countering Violent Extremism program has expanded enormously what is being determined as signs of risk and signs of radicalization. And the whole umbrella of safeguarding children is being expanded without their knowledge, without um, good oversight, without thorough and uh, checks in legislation, and in most countries across the world, this countering violent extremism is somehow just accepted as a norm and that we should not question it. And I'd ask you today to, that we challenge that norm, that we question it, and if you are interested, please go away today and get in touch with us afterwards. If you're interested in looking at your countries across Europe of what is being employed, what software is being used, and which companies are involved in the gathering of this type of information about our children, how it's being used, and what it might be used for in future, that we can protect today's children, today's activists, and those of the future. Yes, you're completely right. I think uh, the title of this panel uh, should have been adopted a tiny bit. Um, so uh, I think the very uh, interesting question is uh, how to challenge um, surveillance and how uh, data collection is being abused. But for me, the big, big question is how do you find out about this? Uh, because uh, there is such a big lack of transparency um, with regard to all those measures. And so I think it's super interesting to hear from Daniel now how you won uh, your court case against the progr PREVENT program and how you managed in the first place to find out that the kid was actually in the database. Um, yeah. I think there's another 
Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Um, in, in, in the education field uh, and, and in terms of children generally, there's a lot of different measures that can be affecting them um, in the UK and, and I, as far as I can tell in uh, other EU countries as well. So in some cases, um, well, you'll have a different source for the measures. So in some cases, that might be legislation. In some cases, it's sort of programs and policies. And in some cases, it's just a sort of unstructured practice that has grown up around um, generating data about children. And you also have a different intent behind those policies and, and practices. So um, some of these programs are aimed at detecting criminal offending. Some of them, like the PREVENT program that's been mentioned, are directed towards um, a, a sort of pre-crime drift towards extremism, however defined. Um, and so in some cases, the intent behind these programs is quite anodyne. It's just collecting statistical information, but then that can be later misused. Um, and you also have a varying degree of centralization. Some, some programs are kind of national in character, some are, are more local. Um, uh, as Kirsten mentioned, I'm going to look at the UK's PREVENT program, which has both a statutory and a non-statutory basis. Um, and it's that it program um, with the aim of detecting pre-crime drift towards extremism. Um, it's framed around uh, at least in the child context, framed around child vulnerability and safeguarding. But as you'll see from this case study, the, the data that's generated about children can then be used against that child uh, in whose name um, the, the safeguarding um, practices were, 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 were operated. Um, in the UK, there's about 2,000 referrals per year under uh, prevent, at least according to official statistics, um, and the referrals are handled by local authority panels who then bring in the police, uh, the home office, the, the, uh, and also uh, the intelligence agencies where, where appropriate or not appropriate. Um, and there's some good reports about it by Open Society and Rights Watch UK, and they're full of examples like a pupil as young as seven being uh, reported into the program for talking about toy guns, um, a child with a Muslim slogan on, on a t-shirt uh, being, being reported, uh, and there's ob an obvious risk of racial profiling and of mission creep, as, as Kirsten noted, the recent news about um, Extinction Rebellion uh, and Greenpeace membership is also um, being um, uh, the police are uh, asking uh, educators to, to note that. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is a case study of a recent case I did about uh, how a pupil could try to get back control over their data having been referred under the program. Um, and secondly, if there's time, I'll just consider whether public authorities should be applying criminal investigation data protection frameworks to this kind of uh, pre-crime data. Uh, so the case uh, was a primary school age child. Um, I can't say exactly why they were referred because of confidentiality stuff, but it was extremely frivolous reason for, for ref referring this child into the PREVENT program. And the, pa the parents had no idea about the referral until they were visited by the local authority social services department who started investigating the family. They in turn um, brought in the police. So I was instructed by the parents to try to get the information about the child deleted. Um, and, and to start off with, um, we had to sort of reconstruct the picture of where that data had, had gone. Um, and we did that by using subject access requests, first to the local authority, because they were the only people we knew had started an investigation. Um, and having made the subject access request, um, argued with them about the application of ex exemptions and then got more information, we then identified that the referral had come from the school and what it was about. Um, 
And we then uh, made further subject access requests to the police and to the Home Office. And piece by piece, we were able to, to reconstruct the um, very complicated data flow that had taken place from just this single meaningless incident. Um, um, and a few takeaways um, from that. Well, first of all, we were able to, to, um, to get all the records deleted using uh, the child's data protection rights, but it took nearly two years and two different legal cases to do it. Um, and we did get him some damages in the end, you know, quite, quite small, but uh, I guess the principle's important. Um, but it was a heck of a lot of effort just for one child. Uh, and a few takeaways from all that, um, that certainly the data protection rights to not just subjects access, but having identified the information, uh, the data protection rights to rectification and, er and erasure were, were crucial. Um, and the way that we used those was that we started with the source of the data, the, the school, um, and once they'd agreed that they should delete, then there was a sort of domino effect, and then the other public authorities agreed to delete their records. Um, but it, the, there was very serious kind of proliferation of that data. The police in particular had the information on three separate databases, a child protection database, which you might expect, but they also had a record against the child's name alone on their criminal intelligence database, uh, which is a sort of national uh, key police database. And then a further database, which um, has only recently been disclosed to the public, the National Police Prevent Case Management Database. Um, uh, another point is that this was incredibly sticky data. It was very hard to get the information deleted, even in what was quite an obvious wrongful referral. Um, authorities want to keep this data, at least in the UK, uh, into adulthood if they can. Um, and the police refused to confirm that they wouldn't use the information in the future for things like criminal record checks against the child, um, a child's name when they were an adult. Um, and retention is, is you know, clearly not necessary or, or proportionate. Um, and in the case of the police, it was only when we threatened to judicially review their entire um, data retention policy that they eventually backed down and agreed to delete the information. Um, uh, one more personal observation um, is that of all the cases I've done challenging surveillance, this case really brought home to me how real and important data protection rights are for ordinary, quotes, families who, you know, haven't paid any attention to privacy debates that probably pe people in this room have been following. Um, you know, you could really see the immense relief that the family had when they knew that that record had been deleted and they were really scared that that was just going to follow their child for life. Um, uh, and lastly, one final takeaway, this case, I mean, it was clearly an unjustified referral under that program and it's obviously going to be much harder to delete uh, justified uh, quotes, uh, referrals. Um, so, you know, it, it's a good case to start with, but um, we're, you know, it, it's obviously not going to be that simple in, in all cases. Um, how long have I gone? Cause yeah, okay, okay. Well, if anyone wants me to, to ask me to talk about um, what exemptions public authorities should be applying in this kind of context, I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah, maybe in the second round. I'm, uh, I just have a follow-up question, a quick, uh, quick question. Uh, is there any other actions now after the court case? Is there any campaigning going on? Uh, or what, what is the follow-up to this now? I mean, I, I've got a couple of other cases on sort of similar facts which are ongoing, but uh, nationally there is a, a review of this PREVENT program going on um, uh, and, but, uh, well, the government initially put in charge of it someone who was one of the key architects of the whole program, but 
that was judicially reviewed and the government conceded that so um, it's kind of awaiting a new chair I think still at the moment so that is an opportunity to try to um, bring out some of these kind of data related issues but you know the, the direction of travel probably not just in the UK I mean there are similar programs throughout the EU is is you know very much along this line okay thanks um, yeah, I think we can move on to Gracie and on to uh, the more, well, advocacy and campaigning uh, parts. Um, so can you tell us a bit about your uh, boycott school census campaign and uh, what was the issue and how, like, what, what was your activism tactics to, to stop it, basically? Yeah, I can talk about all of that and thanks a lot for having me. Um, yep, yeah, so I'm Gracie, I'm policy and campaigns manager at Liberty. And for those of you that don't know, Liberty is a UK human rights organization. We were founded in 1934 um, and our mission is really about standing up to power and we do that through policy and parliamentary lobbying, we do public campaigning, we have an investigative journalism unit, and we also, we're a law firm, we have a litigation unit, so multi-pronged attacks. Um, but prior to being at Liberty, I was part of the Against Borders for Children campaign. Um, so when I say we, I really mean ABC when I'm talking today. Um, so in terms of what was happening, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, in 2010, the coalition government was elected on a platform to cut net migration to the tens of thousands. Um, and in order to do that, they decided to introduce a hostile environment. Um, they didn't tell anybody that for a couple of years. Um, but that hostile environment policy was really... Uh, yes, there's been a hostile environment for migrants more generally in the UK for a very long time. Um, but the hostile environment policy specifically has really been about introducing entitlement checks into essential public services and data sharing schemes between those public services and the Home Office so that people will be deterred from accessing those essential public services and their lives will become so unbearable that they leave the country or those people will attempt to access public services and at that point the Home Office will be able to obtain their address and try to deport them. So that's the broad shape of the hostile environment and if you're interested in reading more about that, that's in this report which is called A Guide to the Hostile Environment. So that was introduced in 2010 and in 2016 it was announced that the Department for Education was going to start requiring all schools to ask for children's nationalities and countries of birth in the school census, which is a data collection that happens every term, and that data goes into the National Pupil Database that Jen talked about. So 2016, we have this announcement that schools are gonna collect nationality and country of birth. This is also around the time of the Brexit referendum, um, kind of the atmosphere around immigration is really, really high. Um, and there were quite a few of us, once this announcement had been flagged to us, who thought, in the context of a hostile environment, we actually don't trust the state with this data. We think it will be shared with the Home Office for immigration enforcement purposes. And that's why the Against Borders for Children campaign was formed. It was really a coalition of parents, teachers, migrants' rights activists, anti-racism activists, um, who got together to try to figure out how to stop it. And really, I was the only one in that small group who had a background in NGO work, human rights work. Um, so we launched the Bo Boycott School Census campaign, uh, and we launched it, first of all, by asking a coalition of 20 human rights NGOs if they would sign up to an open letter to the Department for Education, setting out why we were worried about the data collection. Um, it was interesting in the, even at that point, we had some privacy NGOs who said to us, no, this isn't, this isn't an issue for us. Um, it's not something we should be working on. Uh, there were other NGOs who said to us, why are you campaigning on this? You're just gonna freak everybody out. I mean, it, it was very interesting. Um, but 20 organizations did support us um, and became part of the wider ABC coalition. So we sent that open letter to the Department for Education. There was someone in the campaign group who had done a lot of press work, so who press released it. We got a lot of coverage. Um, we, I spent a lot of time writing to MPs saying, we're really concerned about this data collection. Um, we don't think it should be happening. Can you try and find out what's going to happen with this data? So we were kind of lobbying parliamentarians of all parties. We were asking them to put down parliamentary questions. 
and we were working really closely with Liberty, where I did not yet work at that point, um, who were helping with a lot of the parliamentary stuff. Um, we, one of the interesting things about the data collection was that schools were required to ask for the data, but parents and children were not required to give the data. So they were able to refuse if they wanted to. But school, the Department for Education had one line in its school census um, guidance to schools about this data collection that just said something like, nationality should be as stated on passport. So that basically meant schools were asking for passports, um, which they didn't need to do. It meant that schools weren't asking parents, they were asking kids directly in the classroom. It meant that very few parents knew they had a right to refuse. It meant that there were discriminatory practices in some schools insofar as only kids with foreign sounding names were asked for the data. Uh, only kids who weren't white were being asked to put their hands up. Only some kids were being given letters home to ask for the data. Sometimes schools were just guessing where they thought kids might be from. Um, they were guessing nationalities and countries of birth and that was all going to the Department for Education. So there was incredibly poor practice from schools, but in large part because there was essentially no guidance from the Department for Education and on a really cynical analysis, you would think that if you only mention passports, you know schools are gonna ask for passports even though they don't need to. Um, so we also worked with kind of migrant solidarity groups. We worked with a group of young migrant women um, called Sin Fronteras at the Latin American Women's Rights Service and they made a video about why they have a right to go to school and feel safe. Um, we called a conference and lots of anti-racism activists came to that. We met with civil servants. Um, we did ad hacking, so we took over ads in bus stops, um, we took over ads on the London Underground, um, and basically ev every time it was the census date, we did a different creative action. So we also did one that was called Place of Birth, Planet Earth, and basically got people to ask their kids to draw what, they, what, what that sentence made them think, and then put, uh, put all of those images on social media, um, which ju it just made the government look really bad, you know? It's like, come on, it's kids. Um, we supported parents to write to schools, um, expressing their concerns about the data collection, and Against Borders for Children also took litigation represented by li Liberty about the data collection. So it was really a kind of throw the kitchen sink at it um, campaign. Um, and I think because of the EU referendum um, and because of tensions around the hostile environment, et cetera, the media campaign, that aspect of it was really, really successful. It also helped that the government was lying about stuff. So in December 2016, it, so we'd been saying this whole time, you're going to share this data with the Home Office, and, in, and the government was saying, no, no, this data will not be shared with the Home Office. And in December 2016, it emerged that the Department for Education had had a secret agreement that would have shared this data with the Home Office, but they had to amend it as soon as we started campaigning so that they could say the data won't be shared with the Home Office. So they'd been dishonest about that. It also emerged that... Um, in the previous immigration bill, the government had wanted to introduce measures that would have had schools checking children's immigration status and would have deprioritized the children of undocumented migrants for school places. Uh, now, the nationality data collection was a compromise on those harsher measures, and that correspondence was leaked in the course of the campaign, which of course meant that the papers stayed interested in it. Um, and in a meeting that we had with the Department for Education, their civil servants told us that actually they were using the nationality data for immigration purposes. They weren't sharing it, but was in their matching algorithm. So there were lots of things that had been kept secret that came out over the course of the campaign, which meant that it maintained its momentum. Um, and in terms of results, 200,000 children and parents actively boycotted the census, so they returned forms that said, no, I will not give nationality data. Um, for two million pupils, which is about a quarter of them, there, the, the school just said, not yet obtained. The school just didn't obtain the nationality data. And either that was parents and children not sending the forms in, it was schools forgetting to send the data to the Department for Education. So that was two million records that they didn't have, which basically made the data quality rubbish. Um, 
And in 2018, the Department for Education announced that they would no longer require schools to collect nationality and country of birth data. Um, and that was interesting, I mean, obviously a huge win. It was interesting insofar as actually, we didn't win the legal case because they said it was out of time, but in, in combination with all of the other tactics, we think it probably stressed them out enough that they thought it's not, it's not worth it. If these people are gonna make this stink every, every term, we, you know, we don't wanna deal with it anymore. Um, so that was great. We also took a complaint to the Information Commissioner's Office, which is the UK's Data Protection Authority, um, and we complained to say, can you please say that this data collection was unlawful in the first place because it wasn't for educational purposes. We said, can you delete the data that you hold, the nationality data that you still have? Um, and we complained about something else, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and we very recently got the ruling back from the Information Commissioner's Office. It was a little bit disappointing in that it was just quite vague, but they did say some helpful things. They said that the Department for Education is failing to comply fully in its data protection, primarily in the areas of transparency and accountability. Um, so that has implications for the whole school census national pupil database collection, which obviously Jen is doing great work on. Um, so nationality and country of birth data collection has stopped, amazing, we're all really pleased with that win, especially because all of this campaigning was done before the Windrush scandal happened. Um, so it's before really many people knew what the hostile environment was or why it was terrible, but nevertheless we got that win. However, what we also found out is that children's addresses are being shared between the Department for Education and the Home Office. And that data sharing continues. So that was the third thing that we complained about in the ICO complaint. Um, so between 2015 and 2017, it turns out um, about 1,000 records, 1,000 addresses were given by the Department for Education to the Home Office for immigration enforcement purposes. So that deterrent effect in terms of people being too frightened to send their children to school, um, that deterrent effect is still there because people, frontline support workers can't say to people, you can safely send your child to school, whatever their immigration status, because actually they might still be traced and still be enforced against. Even if the child has immigration status, they may still use it to find an undocumented parent. So that's something we continue to campaign on, both as Against Borders for Children, um, but also at Liberty, we are running a campaign called Care Don't Share, which is calling for a firewall between all essential public services and immigration enforcement, um, both because it affects the rights of migrants who can't access services, but also because of the broader public interest in confidential, in confidential public services, essentially. So if you're interested in that, you can read the Care Don't Share report, which is also on our website. Um, and then I guess the last threat is that the government has now amended data protection law so that the vast majority of data protection rights don't apply when data is being processed for immigration purposes. So that's the next fight that we have to have. Um, and they're also building a very big migrant database, um, which we will also have to, have to stop them from doing. Um, but in any event, we've had some wins um, and hopefully we'll do in the future. So yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, so now from campaigning and activism on to the legal situation. Um, Gloria, yeah, I think we discussed already a tiny bit access and deletion rights, but what else uh, can be done? Like how can the GDPR and the law enforcement directive be used uh, to protect kids? Um, and yes, I think we also have an issue with enforcement um, that you all a maybe, tiny bit, yes. maybe. So yeah. first, uh, thank you, thank you for uh, inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to be here and, and to, to be with so many activists. I'm not an activist and I'm an academic, and but I share uh, basically the, con the the comment, the, the, the concern from Jen about the fact that data protection for children is not an option that you can say, ah, I care for data protection, and additionally, I will also like care for data protection for animals or data protection for vegetarians. Or some, no, no, data protection, if you care for data protection, you care for data protection for all people, and this, some of these people are smaller and, and younger, and they are children, but if you don't care for data protection for children, for me, you're not really caring for, for data protection and privacy in general. It's, it's not, it's part of this. Now, having said this, that I'm not an activist. I was, uh, last year, I participated to a demonstration, and it was not my purpose. I was pushed to this demonstration. I was actually pulled by the hand by my own son, 
So for me, this, this panel is really, it's really meaningful. I, we were in, in Paris, and it was one of the, the worst days of the Gilets Jaunes. It was the Gilets Jaunes somewhere, and, and a climate uh, uh, demonstration somewhere. And everything was closed. We were very bored. And I thought, well, maybe there's a cemetery that is open. So we were at the cemetery. Everything was fine. And then we had the, the noise of the climate change demonstration. Blah, blah, blah. So my son was like, ah, oh, let's go there. Let's go there. So, oh, no, 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 no. And he said, no, come on, mom. It's, it's for the climate. climate. Climate change is important. So I said, yes, OK, we, we go there. So, and we, we went there. And uh, then you are in this demonstration where children are there. And indeed, as a parent, as a, as a mother, you, you have this reflection, what is supposed to be my role? How do I uh, protect people? And, and I missed part of the presentation this morning, which was about this, about these activists uh, being online and, 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 and sharing data about this and, and, and being an activist online today as a child. And I think it, it's very difficult for us to understand what this means, because we, 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 we don't even know we have this myth of the digital natives, like this Children, if they are online, they are supposed to know, but I'm not sure they know that much. Uh, my son is he's 10 years, he received now for Christmas a, a laptop. So when you buy a, a new computer, you have this series of questions that ask you, do you want to share your data for, uh, for improving this, improving that? Uh, you have a question, every question he looked at me and I said, mm. and he said, no. no, 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 no. And at some point he says, yes. And I said, why, why did you say yes? And he said, ah, it, it asks, it's for personalized. It's personalized, therefore it's yes. No? <laughs> this quite kind of privacy, privacy awareness is this. It's, it's very, very low. So uh, I think this is a real question, a real concern that we should have about these children that want to save the planet for some reason, and, and, and they are not that prepared to, to, to they don't know uh, so, so, so many things. And it's uh, really about their future. So that's also in the title of here, is that we are really experimenting with a whole generation of of, of, of people, we don't know what is going to happen. It has never happened before that so many data are collected about everybody and, and, and by some uh, companies. We just don't know what is, what is uh, supposed to happen. What we do know is that in the face of this, as a, as a, to, to face this, we have this thing called data protection, privacy data protection law, and, and this is supposed to help us. At the European level, now with the GDPR, since the reform, we have embraced the idea that children deserve specific protection. This is in the, the preamble of the GDPR. Children deserve specific protection. It's there, the message. The question is, of course, when will they get this, this specific protection? We don't know yet. Maybe they will all be grown up and retired and whatever, and they get the specific protection, but we don't have it yet. So in the GDPR, there's a preamble saying you, you deserve it, and then there are some tools that are, are there uh, to, are supposed to give substance to this. And the, I think the main reason why we don't have yet this specific protection is for something that I learned from, from the United Kingdom, which I like to call the Frosty's effect. I, I call this the Frosty's effect. I think it doesn't exist as such. But do you know Frosty's? Frosty's? Yes. What are Frosty's? So some cereals, no? Some cereals. You know, it's a Toby, the Toby the Tiger, yes? And I read, I read that in the United Kingdom they had a tax on, on sugar on cereals. So you, you were selling cereals to children with a lot of sugar, you had to pay a lot of tax. So uh, producers of, of cereals, they, they reduced the, the levels of sugar. But Frosties, the, the, the Kellogg said, well, if we take the sugar out of Frosties, it doesn't mean a thing, so we keep the sugar. But we will say something, we will say that Frosties is not for children. It is for adults, therefore we don't pay the tax. Ah, smart, smart. <laughs> Well, this is the frosty effects is what we have now in, 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 in privacy. So we have some mechanisms like uh, Article 8. If you target, you, if you deliver a service to children, you have to comply with a series of rules. What do companies do? We don't deliver this service to children. Children, where? This is for adults. We also have some specific uh, obligations for transparency. If you are tar addressing children for your information, uh, you have to ad uh, adapt this information to children. What do they do? They say, we are not at all addressing children, never seen any children. If you happen to see any children, uh, take them out of the internet, and everything is, is your fault. So thanks to the Frosty's effect, nothing is happening, and nothing is following this up in, in general. So that's a problem, and that's very GDPR-related. Indeed, now we are kind of discussing the law enforcement directive. Most of the time, when law enforcement uh, processing is related to law enforcement, it will be the directive. In that case, there are not even actually uh, specific mechanisms. There are some references, because law enforcement issues are not supposed to be about children in principle. Uh, there are just references to the fact that children are vulnerable, 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 and we have to take this into account. Now, this notion of vulnerability is quite uh, tricky in, in relation to surveillance. So we heard that we want to protect children, and therefore we, we, 
vulnerable people, therefore we, we, we put them more and more under surveillance. So I'm not sure is the, the, the ideal framing. We can just give specific protection to children because they are less aware, because they are, have more difficulties with, with their rights, but we don't necessarily need this prism of vulnerability that we have been fighting, for instance, uh, from, from a feminist perspective, and I was reading the, the, the annual report of the Spanish Data Protection Authority of last year, and they say clearly that children and women are vulnerable, which is uh, uh, not the, the, the thing that we are supposed to be thinking uh, nowadays. In the past, uh, we thought that indeed women were always vulnerable. But that's to, uh, the, the thing that we have now in the Law Enforcement Directive. There is also the, this regulation uh, of for EU bodies and EU institutions, which is also very funny. They have a reference in the, uh, to children, and you have to be uh, specifically, especially careful when, target, when targeting children, especially when you sell online tickets. It, if you, if you read this regulation, please do. I don't know. I, I want to find somebody from the EDPS that will explain to me when do EU institutions sell online tickets to children? I don't know. If they, there's some commissioners in circus. I don't know what, what happens there, but it's, 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 very, it's very strange. But this is the level of what we have. So what do we need? We need, indeed, more thinking. People like you who try to actually uh, limit the processing of data that is uh, there. We have now, we know in the context of law enforcement, uh, this embracing of artificial intelligence for law enforcement purposes and a lot of uh, problems with how do we limit then the, the, the processing of data about children. I think it is really a, 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 that a tricky one when we think about new technologies and artificial intelligence. Uh, there was an infamous project that I, uh, so a few years ago, and, and, and luckily for them, I, I forgot the name of this project, but this was about uh, surveillance, smart surveillance. So we know that many of these technologies, and like the ones that you were also describing, are about detecting a, 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 normal, a normal pattern. So things that are funny, no? strange things. And this smart surveillance project funded by the, by the European institutions uh, was about detecting abnormal behavior in the airport. And, and they said, well, we are very privacy friendly because we have a system of smart CCTV cameras and we, we, we see everything, but we only record uh, smart, uh, abnormal uh, behavior. And they only recorded abnormal behavior and after a while of the, they did this test and they looked at what the, the images that they had collected of abnormal behavior of people queuing in, in, in an airport. And of course, who was doing abnormal things and funny things? Children, only children. So they, they had uh, a lot of images of children. Uh, congratulations, a very privacy friendly project that you have. So it was a disaster. So it's, it, it, indeed, we have a problem with how do we limit this? We have to think in advance. I'm not sure we think in, in advance uh, properly. And even worse, there's always this question of keep going back to the, to the issue that, well, children are vulnerable. We need to protect them. We need to help them. And therefore, we need more surveillance. And I was quite disappointed with the, there was a, a report by the uh, Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union. They have a long, long report on facial recognition and, and law enforcement and many things. And they say, well, facial recognition can be problematic, uh, can be a danger, but, but, but it could be useful in some cases. For instance, for uh, uh, finding missing children. And I, I don't know how can you find missing children unless you, you track all children. I don't know. I really, really don't understand because maybe you can look for, I don't know, uh, people who, who kidnap children. But looking, looking for missing children f through facial recognition in a way that would not imply looking at identifying all children, it doesn't make sense. So, so if the FRA is, is publishing these things, I don't know which, where are we going. So what can we do in addition to, to thinking better about this? I think really the question of... Uh, improving data subject rights, and, and I'm very glad that they were useful for you or for, for your client, that's a, a crucial one. So in the title of this panel, there was this question of criminalization of children, and I think there's also a sort of criminalization of data subjects that is going on now in, in, in Europe in general. We know that with the GDPR, we have more possibilities to use our data subject rights, but the more we use them, actually, we more th that we see that when you happen to use your rights, you are very, very quickly, you become a suspect. So you have a right to know who has data about you, but when you ask which data do you have about me, very soon the question is, are you really you? Uh, why do you want this data? A lot of, you become a suspect of doing very bad things just because you, you dare to exercise your, your rights. This is a problem, and this is, I would say, even worse when uh, children are involved, because we, we don't know if children actually are supposed to ask. I think that's not very clear. We, we kind of agree that it's parents who can ask, but it's even worse because if you ask uh, 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 as a mother, as a father, can you give me the data of, uh, of about uh, my children, 
Again, you are criminalized. Again, is it you, you? Is your, uh, your, are your children your children for real? Can you prove this? I am now just doing a, a, an access request in agreement with my son. I, t I told him, let's, we will ask for, uh, for your data to a company. And, and this company is first treating me as a third, saying you are a third that you have to prove. So now I, we did the request online. They want to send a letter to my son, so my son will prove that he is he, and that I, me and me, all of strange things complicated in my life when data subject rights for children should be easier, not more complicated. So I think we, we really need a reflection there that hopefully we can have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gloria. Um, so we now have exactly 30 minutes left for questions and a discussion. Yes, I think one, two, three. You go first. Thank you, and, and thank you for organizing this panel. I have a very simple question, actually. Um, I exercise my rights in terms of data subject access for my son to the school. They accepted the request, but never um, uh, followed up. So my question is, is there a time limit to go to the next step? And what is the next step? Agencia de protección de los datos in Spain, and do I need a lawyer? Um, yes, there is a time limit. I think it's 20 working days, right? According to the GDPR, it's one month, but it, they, can, they can tell you that they require an extra more time if it's difficult. Yes. Yes. So actually, it depends a bit on what you complain. If you complain about the fact that they did not reply, you have to give them the time to not reply. But if you complain because you think they are doing something illegally, you can even just directly go to the, to, to the DPA or to the court and say, I complain because I think they're doing this and this uh, incorrectly. And then you don't have to wait for them not to reply to your, to your request. Yeah, I think the, in the UK, our supervisory authority says you've got three months from your last meaningful contact with the public authority to make a complaint. I think there's a discretion for different authorities to set different time limits, but you can always reset it by just asking again. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Giovanni Battista Carlos. Just uh, uh, wanted to share just uh, two um, stories uh, about Italy. Uh, now we have uh, a law which mandates uh, video cameras in every primary school, each and every cl primary uh, class in primary school, due to, due, to, due to security issues, which is pretty creepy, I think, just uh, teaching pe pupils from the very first time uh, surveillance. And secondly, we have also an electronic registry, which is compulsory since 2015. So ev each and every behavior of the students is recorded in a, in a platform, an external platform, so in a cloud. And we, there are some teachers who are dealing with that and opposing to these systems. And they've been actually suspended for not using this registry. And uh, uh, then there is uh, one, I wanted to um, ask you a question, ask you, all of you a question. You uh, dealt very well with the topics with public, uh, public, I mean, public uh, uh, surveillance. But uh, uh, what do you think about helicoptering parents? So parents who really are in favor of a each and every kind of surveillance, and they would really love to see the children via the webcam in, the, in their classes. What do you think about it? I'm horrified. <laughs> <laughs> In the UK, our cameras in classrooms have begun also monitoring voice and movement. So extension of what the capabilities of these technologies can do is very concerning. I hope you have um, civil society who can keep that in check and balance, and we can talk afterwards otherwise. Um, some of these cameras have the size of a 50 pence piece or a two euro piece. They are very small, they can't be seen, they monitor everything. These commercial companies are then huge collectors of behavior data, as you talk about. We have 
apps in the UK that are also operating worldwide that monitor every behavior, good and bad. They use a sound to announce to the rest of the class if a peer has been awarded a bad negative behavior point. The sound announces in the classroom. Um, peer shame is becoming a surveillance tactic which has a chilling effect on children's behavior. If you're an academic, a huge research opportunity. There is very little research onto what is the mental health effects of these surveillance technologies in schools. Because let's not mistake behavior monitoring, behavior tracking, and behavior recording is surveillance and it has a chilling effect. And it has it by design. These are intentionally restricting children's behaviors which are seen to be negative. And when the apps are not um, monitored for effectiveness and for who determines what is successful, what is good, what is bad. Simply going to the toilet is seen as negative behavior in some classes in England now. So that borderline between who determines what is good and what is bad is being crossed over in these apps and has a, a, a connection to the apps that parents install themselves on children's mobile phones and it is this problematic balance between child protection and safeguarding and the interference with the child's own rights and freedoms. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 3, places the emphasis on the best interests of the child. And there is th a conflict sometimes between who determines what that is, where it comes with the rights of the parent, where it comes to the rights of the child themselves, and also where in loco parentis, in the school and education system, where that boundary sits. Um, from behavior monitoring, and when we were talking about the web monitoring of online behavior, that boundary has been crossed uh, by far in our education system in England uh, because it monitors outside the home. And the increase of the use of mobile phones and the monitoring of that by children, uh, the use of that by children by school, so imposing software that monitors their own personal device, and the parents imposing software that monitors a child's own device, means that the child is constantly monitored 24-7. So I think we, s we have a uh, chilling effect, intentional or not, um, and pa parents, well-meaning parents, often overstep their own boundaries on, on where that border lies. We need much greater conversation about it. We need, obviously, parents to have good conversations with their children. Um, but the question I always ask my friends is, when do you stop? What age do you stop monitoring your child? Because honestly, I think my 10-year-old, 11-year-old child is probably far less likely to get into trouble and go places and be with people or boyfriends that I might not want her to meet than my 16-year-old. But that is the point where you say, how far does a parent's reach into a child's private life extend? And uh, I'm very much opposed to those types of apps. Anybody else want to hear? Like Gloria, helicopter, no? You're not, okay. <laughs> uh, then, uh, yeah, Joe. I'm kind of disturbed about how specifically Jen addressed each of the points I was about to raise without me raising them. Um, I wanted to come back to the chilling effect. Um, Ofsted, the UK Schools Inspectorate, which is not an activist organization or anything other than very conservative, uh, did a report in 2010 saying that pupils uh, were more vulnerable overall when schools used lockdown systems because they were not given enough opportunities to learn to assess and manage risks for themselves. If that was the case in 2010, when you add on top of that the self-censorship uh, that's likely to be happening, surely is there some way of getting independent research done, building on what Ofs uh, Ofsted uh, found 10 years ago that hasn't been actioned and has been neatly archived on the, the government website? Um, in order to, to create some, some pressure. And follow, tying into that, again, anticipating my, my question, the, the Child Rights Convention, um, the last um, response from the Child Rights uh, 
committee of the, uh, the UN called for more um, data collection um, in order to fully guarantee children's rights to uh, freedom of movement and peaceful assembly with regard to uh, monitoring of children for antisocial behavior. Uh, that was in 2016, so it appears to be about the right time for all of this data to be collected neatly and, and given to the uh, committee for its periodic report, which I guess is due next year, yeah? Um, so, data on, uh, data on the, the harm to children uh, of these measures and data to the CRC Secretariat to um, create some external pressure. I mean, I know, I know the UK has left planet Earth now, but um, some peer pressure might still be possible. I mean, Europe, I think. Any reaction to Joe's statement from Joe? No? Just to, to add this, uh, things to do, uh, if you care about the subject, I know the, so the, the United Nations Rapporteur on Privacy, Joe Canatachi, he's working uh, this year on uh, privacy in children. And the person assisting him on this will be at CPDP, if you stay around for CPDP, so or ask me if you don't know who she is. Um. So far you've discussed governmental surveillance, uh, school surveillance, par parents surveilling the children, and the picture's getting pretty dark already, but I maybe want to add an extra party in this uh, mix to make it even more gloomy. Um, but I was wondering, is there also research or thoughts or work being done or uh, children actually surveilling each other? Uh, yeah, sounds maybe weird, but I, a report has also revealed that children are less involved in risk, riskful behavior because of the fear that their peers will film them and put on YouTube if they're, I don't know, drinking a little bit too much or doing weird stuff. Um, I, I was wondering what your thoughts about that are and if you're working on that, uh, maybe the peer-to-peer the -peer surveillance uh, nature for children. The peer-to-peer -peer, um, exchange of communications is really problematic in lots of ways in, I mean, I can only speak mainly to the UK at the moment, um, is that the chilling effect of children's behavior in how they r interact with each other on platforms, I think is little documented. There's a little research show, I was at the Privatheit, pr uh, Forum Privatheit in Berlin in November. Um, there was, um, uh, academics there in, in Hamburg are doing research on children's own online activity and interactions. Um, the UK takes the approach of um, being rather punitive in terms of uh, children's any, uh, for example, sexting um, and sharing of nudes, even between children, uh, between teenagers, is seen as criminal um, and can end up criminalizing uh, children, you know, older children in a relationship, um, which police themselves and discussions we've had with them have said is very problematic. Um, but in terms of, the, you know, in terms of how it's being monitored in the classroom and this sort of effect it has on children right now as a society, as a community, I think has serious implications about how we expect to monitor each other's behaviors as adults. It normalizes the idea that if you get a bad behavior point, I am allowed to uh, put pressure on you not to do that. Um, the, the child who perhaps is just, has special educational needs, or is slightly different, or is uh, of a different color, or a different background, or a different language, is somehow othered. And the idea that behaviors in a class can therefore be permanently recorded, I think is new. And I think this is concerning for us that you can have a permanent record of insignificant things that you've done as a child in education which build up a profile over time and it is not allowed to be forgotten. The system always remembers, these commercial companies always remember, Daniel's work uh, and Gracie's in terms of the immigration service, the home office, have a permanent record of children's activities. 
And what are the implications for that as a future adult society is really concerning and I think we need to engage much more with. Yes. Um, uh, we're just shortly coming back to the question on helicopter parents. Yeah, uh. yeah my, brain, my brain got there in the end. No, um, because I guess what I, was, what I was thinking about was sort of parents being supportive of surveillance. And obviously, because I work on sort of policing and counter-terror and immigration as well, what I understand by surveillance, and, you know, if you read the critical literature, you know, it's quite expansive. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the UK, because there's this massive moral panic about knife crime, um, you know, we're seeing more police in schools. Um, we're seeing when there was a facial recognition deployment in Stratford, which is East London, which is very high ethnic minority population. Um, you know, some newspapers asked people in the area, you know, do you support this? Do you oppose it, etc. And, you know, lots of people referenced knife crime specifically and said, well, if it's going to help deal with that, then, yeah, we think it's a good idea. Um, similarly, when the government was talk consulting on introducing what are called knife crime prevention orders, which are basically civil orders that can dictate kind of where a person goes, what they do, where they have to be at a certain time, etc. If they are believed to have carried a knife in the last 12 months, so they don't actually have to have been convicted of anything, um, and it might just be hearsay evidence that means that they have one of these orders on them. If you breach one, it's a criminal offence. Again, there were some parents who were very supportive because they were saying, well, look at what's happening in our communities. We're really, really frightened. And again, the government's trying to introduce something called the serious crime prevention duty or serious violence prevention duty, which is prevent, but for knife crime. So it's loads of data sharing between public services, essentially. And again, people are obviously supportive of that. And so I guess what we come back to is that issue of in some respect, in some respects, people aren't safe sometimes. And when the state has been stripped back because there's an austerity agenda, the one thing that does tend to get offered is surveillance, whether it's in the form of policing or whether it's more high-tech stuff like the stuff that Jen's been talking about. Um, and I suppose it just brings me back to the importance of thinking through kind of what is community safety that doesn't rely on surveillance because we can't always say you're not right you're not it's not right that you're worried about that thing because it is sometimes right that someone's worried but we do need to continuously point out that you know 10 20 years ago there were other interventions there were other resources surveillance didn't used to be the only solution so yeah just to come in on the back of that the um i i think in the UK, at least at the moment, young um, urban ch sort of teenagers are a specifically targeted cohort. They're a, a specifically targeted vulnerable group like, you know, I've been used to working with Muslim communities in the past and, and they're becoming a group targeted by the police in that way. So, for example, that, you know, they're using all, all, all manner of technology, the in-classroom stuff, but also things like the um, Celebrite um, phone scanning software that police have access to now. So through the use of extremely broad stop and search powers in London, they can stop a teenager, they'll take their phone, they'll download it, and nobody really knows what's happening to all that data, but it's incredibly useful to them and they'll be sort of constructing whole kind of um, sort of you know, mapping the, the activities of, of youths um, uh, in those areas. So it's, yeah, it's incredibly serious. Um, we, we tend to concentrate on, 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 uh, on how surveillance is being used by state actors, but uh, frankly, I'm more concerned with non-state actors. And uh, uh, are you aware of any research on how uh, how surveillance of, of, of communication of youth on platforms like Instagram or, or Facebook uh, is impacting uh, the uh, is impacting the the, 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 the youth uh, because there is like like the, the, the whole new problem of for example like 
if you get banned on Facebook, then you are effectively excluded from your from your peer group. So that impacts behavior as well, not according to the, uh, but just to the to the to the internal regulation of, of Facebook and the way the the Facebook uh, processes things. So, are you aware of, of such research uh, in? So I just want to, to react to this question, saying no, I don't have any uh, info about research about this, but uh, from a legal perspective, I think it's important that we, we don't need to have research on the impact of these kind of things on uh, youth to know that it's a bad idea. So that people have a right, and, and we were talking about the lessons that we learned from the United Kingdom. There's this famous Marper case, Marper, a judgment from the Court of Justice in uh, the Human Court in, in Strasbourg, which was about the, the retention of DNA samples it was a, a practice in the United Kingdom, so you had somebody who was suspect of having committed an offense. They collected the DNA samples and they stored this like for life. And there were complaints, one of them fr from, from a child, I think he was 11 years old, because actually it could be that simply you, you, your ball fall in the, fell in the neighbor, or the garden of the neighbor, the neighbor called the police, they took your DNA sample and this was there. We don't need research to know that this is a bad idea that you should not store this kind of information about people, um, about children, because in the future it can be used. And in that case, if indeed you're storing the data of everybody, it, it's, it's a bad idea also to store it about from data from children. And I don't need uh, more research to know that it's a bad idea that schools collect this uh, kind of information. I, I'm not from the United Kingdom, I'm from, from Barcelona. And like recently we have now this uh, sort of rise of the, in all countries and member states in, in Europe, we have this rise of a little uh, far right parties. In, in Spain, there's also one, uh, this box, and, and they negotiated recently um, some agreements, like regional agreements. And, and it was very interesting, one of the, of the agreements that they reached with another party, they had a series of measures, like the, this party from the far right. The first measure was we, we want all schools to give us data about the migra migration status of children, first. Second point, we want all schools to give us uh, data about who is given classes about gender diversity and sexual orientation. And it's, so all these data that are being collected, we need research to prove that it's a bad idea that you collect this data, that somebody, uh, it could be the ni nice government or the bad government, they will come and try to use it for whatever purposes. Of course, if there's research, that's, that's great, but just to, to, to remind us that we, we know it's, 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 it's a bad thing as a practice. No, no, we... Yeah, because it could be a good idea to, to collect all this data. I don't think it's... But yes, you can research. Yes. Okay. Um, do you want a further comment on that, or can I pass on to the next? I, I have a follow-up question on, on mentioning the phone infiltration and, and downloading of, of uh, children, uh, teenagers' data in the street. Um, has anyone tried to track that down with data subject access requests to find out where that information ends up, who's using it, what governmental agencies are using, deleting that data at some point, or maybe not? It sounds really scary. Um. Privacy International have done some work around the use of uh, the Celebrite um, software. Well, it's not a software, it's a piece of hardware. Um, yeah, police forces in the UK have, have been using it. Um, and a bit like the, the school um, software uh, monitoring what pupils are doing uh, online, um, the way that this stuff gets rolled out in the UK, I sometimes wonder if it is intentional, is that it's kind of ad hoc. So certain police forces have been using this technology, others haven't, so it's very hard to sort of track who is using it and what they're using it for. Um, Privacy International have done a report about it, um, but they have been blocked um, in their freedom of information requests from getting really detailed information. They're relying on exemptions quite similar to the exemptions under data protection law but they're a bit wider under the UK's freedom of information law but there is quite a helpful report about it it's freely you can buy this stuff like online can't you so I'm I'm pretty sure that other EU police forces will be using it too but Uh, 
Thank you very much for the interesting panel. It's uh, extremely interesting to be here and to learn about the topic. I'm very new, so I'm going to ask about the place of children in this conversation. Where where are they uh, when we're having a conversation about their privacy? Um, are they are like being proxied by the parents always? Are they going to be fully represented when they're actually being heard what they want to, to have as their own privacy. So kind of like, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> again, new to the, to the domain, so. You're absolutely right. We keep talking about children and not with them and for them and not letting them speak for themselves too often. Um, but what I am encouraged by is work we did over uh, this year with a youth group in the north of England who are very much aware of, more, more aware than we may think of privacy risks of co corporate and commercial surveillance. And they made some great uh, films over the summer about uh, how they feel about uh, privacy and data protection. But the greatest challenge is getting their voices heard and how do we actually enable them to have space and platforms to be heard? And how do we justify the concerns that people have about children and involving children and protection of them and their rights and being parental rights of age of participation? We in ourselves, I would love to have children on social media, on uh, short films, uh, talking about this. But then I struggle with, I then put their voice out on social media forever. I don't allow my own children to use TikTok. I don't want their voice permanently recorded out on the social on the internet forever. So it's really challenging. Um, but I think the more we can move aside, actually let children and, and not even let them, just give them the space themselves to speak up. And as Gracie was talking about the work that you did with uh, Sin Frontera, Sin Frontera you know, um, that was some of the most powerful work a Against Borders for Children did, where young people were part of the protests, they were on the street, they were in front of the Department for Education, they were making videos, um, and we hope that they will uh, be taking part in our work over the next program, over the next, our work in the next, in the next year. But I th just wanted to chip into that question. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that I would add is that when working with Sin Frontera to a really great, that group of young migrant women is basically supported by the Latin American Women's Rights Service in England. And basically they had to stop campaigning with us because they lost their funding. So part of it is about how do we resource young people to mobilize and also get funders to listen to them when they're saying we want to do this thing, you can trust us to do this thing. Um, can, how do we get resources to them? Um, because it was really, it was really sad that Sinfronteras couldn't keep going, and now they've got the funding again. But you know, they have to. It's stop, start, and it's all, it's all really precarious. The other thing I'd say, just that on the school census campaign more generally, we had the issue of the fact, and on all of the campaigning around undocumented migrants, we have the issue that people are already too frightened to present themselves to essential public services. And that means they'll, they don't want, they will not front a campaign, basically. Um, they're already frightened, even though we're obviously not the state, Liberty is the organization. Actually, all official looking bodies start to look quite similar. And so it's really hard to build trust with groups of people. And even then, because of where they're positioned, they still can't necessarily be the spokesperson. So it was really hard to find someone to bring litigation, for example, because if you're an undocumented migrant, your primary concern isn't suing the Department for Education about some data sharing scheme. So that's the other issue that we have to contend with. Um, we are slowly but surely running out of time. Uh, I think there was one last question and then uh, Mike Okay, t two last questions and super quick answers, please. And uh, yeah, then we we'll Yeah, it's just quick and practical because suddenly I feel so lucky to be in Belgium. I just wondered if there was um, an update about the situation in different European countries. Because I mean, I know situation in England is about as bad as it can be in Europe on that aspect. Uh, I hear uh, cameras in classrooms in Italy. I don't think we have it here for now, but I don't know about elsewhere. Is there a place where we can get a general overview of where things are, are going? Yeah. 
Thanks, I'm Mike from Open Rights Group. And I'm curious about the role of teachers in all this. There's the educational system, and then there are teachers. And I suspect, I mean, are, are they being surveilled in these laboratory classrooms as well? Are they, are they being evaluated in the same way? Is there any potential that they could be actually an ally as sort of being a witness to all this? Or is there any sense of, of sort of where they stand? Um, I would suggest since we only have two minutes left uh, that I give the opportunity to each one of the panelists to respond to both questions and do a short uh, concluding. Yeah. Just go ahead, Gloria. Yes. Uh, so teachers, in principle, yes, they, they are a key player, uh, and, and I think they, they should. I was involved in a project which was about education in schools, awareness about data protection, and we had some interesting conversations, and we tried to uh, give some useful materials, but my most interesting conversation was with, with somebody from a trade union, and he was very much uh, concerned with the fact that we are always asking teachers to teach about everything, and of course, the, the teachers are not paid more because they will also uh, teach about data protection and they don't have the time to be educated about this. So it, it's, it's, they can be a very good player, but then we have to take them seriously and, and, and make sure that the system gives the time to give them the time to, to actually do this properly. For instance, in Spain, there's now in the, in the new like the, the, the law specifying the GDPR, there's a special obligation to have education on data protection in schools. So it could be this could be facilitating a real uh, commitment from teachers. And, and that's uh, for it. Um, I don't have anything really on this question. I, I think just one short closing comment from me is that um, I think there are, um, although it is hard to find uh, pupils and families that are concerned about this, they are out there. Um, so when it comes to legal challenges around in this area, um, I'd encourage people to think about those families and individuals um, pursuing the cases rather than, as we've seen in the surveillance, er government surveillance, mass surveillance area, it's tended to be NGOs pursuing the legal actions, but I think this is an area where um, you can find that story that will, that will play a lot better in, a, in the public sphere and in a courtroom uh, more than just another NGO bringing a legal case. Um, yeah, just on the point about teachers, um, the National Education Union, which is basically the biggest teachers union in the UK, is one of the co-signatories to the Care Don't Share campaign, and they have been a really vocal um, kind of party in campaigning for the data of all migrant children to be safe in the education system. But that just made me, I suppose, one of the things that I find as someone who has ended up doing surveillance work because I was doing other stuff and not because I am a surveillance person is that it's really important to go to where people are and to think laterally about how issues intersect. So if I was trying to mobilize teachers, I would be looking at the fact that in the UK, they're basically fighting for basic pay and conditions and dignified working conditions because conditions are so awful. And so there you would be thinking, well, why don't we look at how much is being spent on surveillance tech in schools? Like, why isn't that going to teachers' salaries? So I think it's really important to try and think that way around rather than kind of being in a surveillance silo and not meeting people where they where they already are. Yep. So in terms of teachers, we have, um, we find basic teacher training does not incorporate privacy or data protection. Um, and that is common, I think, across a lot of countries. Um, and we hope that that will change over the next couple of years. Uh, we're, we're working with, with government to try and introduce that in, in the UK. But I think it speaks to everyone being seen as having a certain role. And I think increasingly we have to be trying to engage better with different communities that see digital and data and data privacy, uh, data and privacy, data protection, not as a bolt-on, but as integral to so much of the activity that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, it's so pervasive across the whole of the public sector. And the uh, across Europe, um, the GDPR rulings should have that effect that we're able to join up. What has worked in one place could be, w could be effective somewhere else. So I think just today, um, None of Your Business uh, has launched a GDPR hub, and they are sharing, giving us a platform to be able to share better how decisions have been made and enforcement action that has been made, 
Certainly, you know, Sweden decided this summer that um, a community school was unlawfully introducing facial recognition technology in schools, even though they had gone out and collected ostensibly consent. It was a very important decision because they ruled that you know, consent under Article 6 in a school could simply not apply because of the power imbalance between the teachers, the pupils, and the parents, that consent was not applicable. This is a significant decision for the whole of the data collection in the education sector. Equally, France decided, uh, Canil came back with two decisions in, in France schools, facial recognition was uh, too invasive and should not be used. So those decisions we have to start applying better as a community, that we see um, how they could be applied in different countries. Their hub is useful. Um, I think we do need to better talk about how we join those things up. But I think you know we have to start seeing how these decisions affect children especially around things like facial recognition, around uh, pervasive data valence and the use of AI and machine learning and uh, the predictive nature of technologies that's being tested in schools right now. It's being tested on behavioral apps, it's been tested on facial recognition, it's being tested around identifying pre um, potential extremism uh, and we are seeing how these technology companies are then going to export that experience their learnings and to go to the question earlier about the, they're using these big commercial platforms keeping that knowledge within their commercial platforms for profit and they are then going out and being able to export that technology into other parts of our communities into other parts of society having tested it on children so i think if you get the chance in your own communities and back home investigate more on what's going on in schools and uh, get children and young people involved as much as we can, and we hope we can carry on the conversation. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful concluding statement, Jen. A uh, big round of applause for the speakers.